Good afternoon. I'm going to tell you a story about how we, me and my team, diagnose Parkinson's disease by its odour. Oh, and I'm going to tell you how we also use an analytical technique called mass spectrometry to do that. And I'm going to tell you about Joy. So here's an image of Joy, who's a 68-year-old retired nurse from Scotland. And she's sitting at an analytical instrument, which is a mass spectrometer. And she's smelling. She's smelling compounds. And the mass spectrometer, it's also detecting compounds, but it's doing it in a different way. It's doing it by weighing them. So there she is, this retired nurse from Perth, smelling molecules at a mass spectrometer. And I got her there. I got her to that lab to do that experiment. It wasn't an experiment she thought she'd ever do in her life. So what was she smelling? And how did we get there? How did I get her to that lab? That's the story I'm going to tell you. The story starts off quite a long time ago. Here's an earlier picture of Joy. She's with her family, her children, and her husband, Les, on the left-hand side. He also is a medically trained professional, a consultant anaesthetist. And this is a happy family picture. Um, life was good. But in 1982, something happened. Joy's got a really good sense of smell, um, and she's also really able to distinguish odors. More on that later. She noticed her husband smelt differently. And, you know, they were young people. He was working hard in closed operating theatres. And she said, look, Les, I think you need to wash more. Uh, <laughs> this did not go down well in the Milne household. And um, anyway, life went on, the smell went on, and other things started happening. And, and really devastatingly, in 1994, 12 years after she'd first smelt that odor, Les was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He was 44 years old. Parkinson's disease is a devastating condition. We think of it as an aging disease, but that's because we live longer now. So it will affect one in 15 people in the world. Of those, around about one in 20 are like Les. They're under the age of 45. So it isn't just an aging disease. Joy and Les are medical people. They continued in their jobs. They continued as best they could. And they're very active people. And they did a lot of good over the intervening years. But Les's symptoms continued to deteriorate. And in a few years later, they moved back to Scotland. Um, and here's a picture of them around about the late 2000s. And they're wearing T-shirts from a charity called Parkinson's UK that funds work to, to detect and, and understand Parkinson's disease. And they started doing things like this. They started interacting more with other people with Parkinson's. And in 2009, they went to an event where there were lots of people with Parkinson's. And Joy noticed something really remarkable. They all smelt like Les. So she hadn't known that before. She just thought Les's smell had changed. But now, no, all the people with Parkinson's smelt like that. So Joy and Les are clever people, and they're medical people, and they knew because she'd smelt it so early in him that this potentially could lead the way to much earlier diagnosis. But they couldn't do that themselves. They needed to find some people to help them do that. And they, they looked, and they researched, and they found this man, Dr. Tilo Kunath, a collaborator of mine at the University of Edinburgh. He was giving a talk in an, in a, to an audience rather like this one, a mixed audience. It was a public information talk about his beautiful work using a stem cell model to understand the biochemistry of Parkinson's disease. So he'd finished his talk, and he kind of he'd had that moment of relaxation at the end of a talk. This lady at the back puts her hand up, and the lady was Joy. And she said, that's all very well that you're doing all that biochemistry, but what about the fact that people with Parkinson's smell differently? Tilo was completely bowled over by this. This was just not what the topic of his talk had been about. And he, <laughs> you know, he thought, who is this lady? What, you know? And uh, anyway, he, he talked to Joy, and he, he got a little bit, but he, he, he really just didn't know why she was saying that. Um, but it niggled at him. He thought about it. And, and actually, he rang me up um, the next day or the, the day after and 
We were collaborating on Parkinson's disease, particularly on the protein alpha-synuclein that aggregates as part, as part of the disease progression. I was using mass spectrometry to weigh it. He was, was a byproduct of his stem cell research. And he rang me up and he said to me, Purdy, what is smell? What is smell? And I said, oh, smell, it's molecules. And he said, yeah, that's what I thought. So could you weigh them? And I said, yeah, mass spectrometry can weigh them, sure. And could you find out what they are? And I said, yeah, that's what we could do. But what is smell? Well, this is what Joy thought smell was. This is an image that she made for me. It's a batik. She made it with um, tie-dye. And it represents how she smells, not just the complexity of smell in all of those colors, but actually how she's able to identify smells in the way that you can see the colors in this image. That's how she does it. So we had this conversation about smell. We thought about it and, and so on. And, and, and actually then, to my sort of eternal shame, um, I said to Tilo, but Tilo, are you sure she's not just seeing the known movement symptoms of people with Parkinson's and associating a smell with that? So essentially, I didn't believe her. And Tilo had met her, <laughs> and he did believe her. And, and, and so he, he said, no, come on, this could be something. We've got to do something about this. So we thought, and we thought, and Tito thought, we said, we, okay, we've got to do an experiment where we take the movement symptoms, the, the people, if you like, who have Parkinson's, away from the odor. And so that experiment, we did it, and it involved some T-shirts. So here's Joy, again, smelling a T-shirt. So we took 12 identical Fruit of the Loom t-shirts and we, we gave them to people with Parkinson's, six people with Parkinson's, and six control subjects. And then we took the t-shirts, cut them in half, put them in bags, and took them to Joy to smell. Simple t-shirt test. We'd taken the smell away from the people. So Joy smelt them, and in Seven of the cases, she said, they had the Parkinson smell. And it was more than seven, actually, because we cut them in half. So we put those T-shirts, and she put them back together, a little bit like the TEDx jigsaw head. She recreated the people from the smell. This was a strong smeller. That's one person. This was weaker, but Parkinson's, that's one person. This isn't Parkinson's, and that isn't Parkinson's either. So she did that really well. But I told you there were six people with Parkinson's. So yeah, there were, and she'd got all of those right all those six people, but, but what about the other one? What about this one? There was one that she said had Parkinson's, but he was from our control group. So what happened there? Well, that person, that one T-shirt, was actually someone called Bill, and he was a control subject. But nine months later, he came back and he said to us he'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So that was remarkable. It wasn't just Les that Joy could smell the smell before a doctor could diagnose Parkinson's. It was Bill, too. There was another remarkable thing about the T-shirt test. So we knew now there was an odor, and we knew that Joy could diagnose it, and we actually also knew from Bill that it could happen early. But the odor wasn't in the armpits of the T-shirt. That's what we thought it would be. In fact, I had a student with gauze strapped to his armpits, running up and down hills to, to, you know, to develop a method. But it wasn't the armpits. It was somewhere else. It was on the neck and the upper back. So, so why was it there? What was the smell? What, was, what, what part of, why do we have a, a bigger smell there? We have odor in that part of our body because of a substance called sebum. Sebum is something I expect most of you haven't heard of. Maybe when you were teenagers or those of you who are still going to be teenagers, you'll worry about it because it's where you get a breakout, here on your T area of your face and maybe the middle of your back. It's an oily substance with waxy esters and fatty acids in it, and it helps to keep our skin kind of supple, lubricated. So at times, we produce too much of it, definitely when we're teenagers. And then there are other conditions where people do produce more sebum than they perhaps need. And in fact, in 1927, a cardiologist called David Crestin had noticed that people who had Parkinson's disease suffered from seborrheic facies, essentially large breakouts and an excess of sebum. And he reported this, and he said this could be used to diagnose Parkinson's. But he was a cardiologist, and his work was ignored. In fact, he was shunned by the neurological community. 
This is an image from his paper, his 1927 paper, and you can see this is a young lady because in those days it was mainly young people that were being studied. And you can see the shininess on her face and the breakouts. This was someone with Parkinson's. So he was right, he said it. And, and now, rolling forward to today, we knew there was an odor of Parkinson's and it was present in sebum. But we needed to find out what was causing that odor. So we needed to run a trial, and we needed to do an experiment that replicated what Joy could do, and did a little bit more to tell us what it was, to tell us what the odor was. So the sebum was really helpful. It allowed us to collect, and it allows us to collect in a really simple way. We just take some medical gauze, we run it on the back of people's necks, can do it on foreheads too, and here's a, an image from our patient information leaflet. We've had a marvelous response from the clinical community in the United Kingdom. And there's 25 collecting sites all over the country that send us samples. So they collect easily from people with Parkinson's disease and from control subjects. In fact, we use the accompanying people. We use their, the, their carer often, their partner who comes with them to clinic as a control. And the samples get mailed to us just regularly in the post. And we take them and we analyze them. So this is how we do the mass spectrometry experiment to find what compounds there are that give the odor that's distinctive of Parkinson's. So in the um, experiment that Joy does, or any of us do when we smell something, molecules go up through the air, and so we do that too. We heat, take the gauze and we heat it up to make the molecules come off the gauze. And then there's quite a lot of them actually on our skin. There's, there's many hundreds of molecules that we might be able to detect, and indeed we do. So we need to separate them. And so we use a technique called gas chromatography, which allows us to separate the molecules. And you can think of this a little bit like a race. So if we just put them straight into the mass spectrometer, they'd all come at once, and, and we wouldn't know who'd won. We wouldn't know who they were. So we separate them out using gas chromatography. They go around a column. And then they go to the mass spectrometer. And we weigh each one of them. So we have two bits of information about each one of those compounds. We have the time it takes them to go through the GC column, and we have their mass, their weight. And we use that to help us find out what they, they are. We use that to identify them. When we did that with the samples we looked at, we found if we compared the samples from people with Parkinson's to the people without, there were significant differences. There were 17 compounds that were really different between the control and the patient samples. And of those, four were significantly different, and they always varied in the same way. So three of them were significantly upregulated, much, much more of them than expected in the control subjects, and one of them actually was downregulated. And that allowed us to build a model, which means now we could swab from any one of you and in nine out of ten cases, we could distinguish someone with Parkinson's to someone without. So we're correct on predicting Parkinson's from these odors. We didn't just do the mass spectrometry experiment, though. We went back to Joy. And this is her again. This is a close-up of the image I showed you at the beginning of this talk. This is her sitting on an odor port. And that odor port is located just at the end of the GC column before the compounds go to be weighed. And we just tee off a little bit, and Joy sits there. And using something rather like my clicker here, she clicks when she smells a compound. And so when we did that experiment that I showed you at the beginning, she was smelling the compounds coming from the gauze, being separated and weighed. And she said, that smells like Les. That smells like Les in real time. She diagnosed Parkinson's, and the mass spectrometer told us what it was. So what are we going to do next? You may have seen the numbers that we've looked at so far, that we've published so far, are relatively small. We're pretty happy with the results. But we need to go to more people. And we need to do something else. We need to push the diagnosis earlier, like Joy could do. We need to do it before we get to the stage when a clinician would normally diagnose Parkinson's. And why is that? It's because as the disease progresses, the dopamine-producing neurons decrease. They go down. And that happens before the symptoms really are observable. So for the majority of people, before they're diagnosed, by the time they're diagnosed, there's been too much damage. So that normal stage of diagnosis is just too early. It's too, sorry, it's too late. We want to make it earlier. We want to push it earlier, like Joy could do. We want to detect 
before the symptoms happen, before the decrease of, of dopamine-producing neurons. So that's our ambition. But there's another thing. We've sampled from a lot of people. And we've sampled always from sebum. And sebum's a substance that really is not very much known about. I suspect most of you really haven't thought about it before. But it's a substance that traps volatile compounds, like this birdcage is trapping the bird. And there are other diseases that have an odour. We know about dogs that can smell cancer. We know about paramedics that are taught to smell the breath of people to see whether they have diabetes. So we know that there is odour and disease are related. And so what if we could take sebum from anyone and look for metabolites that would be diagnostic of a disease, preserved there, as in agar? So we, I've told you about how we diagnose the scent of Parkinson's. Thank you. There's just one more thing I have to tell you. It's been great to come here to Palo Alto. It's out of my backyard. This is, this, is not, this is not home. And so I had to bring someone with me. But there are other reasons. It's because this is Joy's story. So Joy Milne, I'd like to introduce you to her.